Saludos a todos, and thank you for joining us for Evening Conversations. My name is Mariana Garcia. I'm a museum educator at, Con at Connecticut's Democracy Center at Connecticut's Old State House, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to a virtual panel, Siempre Presentes, Shedding Light on Latina History. This event is co-sponsored in partnership with El Instituto, Institute of Latina, Caribbean, and Latin American Studies at the University of Connecticut. El Instituto is a multidisciplinary research and teaching institute that advances scholarship, creative endeavors, undergraduate and graduate instruction, and academic advising across a multiple of disciplines in the fields of Latino and Latin American studies. Its mission is to advance knowledge about the lives of Latino people in Connecticut, nationwide and around the world, as well as provide support for research on Caribbean and Latin America related topics to UConn students and faculty. We're very happy to be working with the Instituto once again. For the Connecticut Democracy Center at Connecticut Salt State House, our goal is to link history and civics and encourage participation in state government. Uh, March is Women's History Month, and in this program, we'll be highlighting a group of women whose achievements as leaders, artists, and scientists and activists often goes uncelebrated, and whose image has often been hijacked for the benefit of other groups. I'm talking, of course, about Latinas, and we'll be shedding some light on their stories tonight. Uh, during the program, please feel free to post your questions in the comments section, and we'll be sure to get those. Uh, we'll get to those. And uh, we have an incredible panel of women from all over the, the country. But first, please allow me to introduce our moderator for this evening, Dr. Ariel May Lamb. Uh, Dr. Lamb is an assistant professor of history at UConn Waterbury Campus, where she teaches Latin American, Caribbean, and U.S. history courses. She received her PhD from Columbia University in 2014. Her book, No Barrier Can Contain It, Cuban Antifascism and the Spanish Civil War, was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2019. Ariel's current research examines Cuban political exiles in the United States during the period between Cuba's independence from Spain and the Cuban Revolution of the 1950s. Ariel, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Mariana, and welcome to all. I'm mm -hmm. so pleased to introduce our panelists for this evening. First is Ruth Glasser, my colleague at UConn Waterbury. Ruth is an associate professor in residence in urban and community studies at the University of Connecticut. She received her PhD from Yale University in 1991. She is the author of My Music is My Flag, Puerto Rican Musicians and Their New York Communities, 1917 to 1940, which was published in 1995, Aquí Me Quedo, Puerto Ricans in Connecticut, published in 1997, the co-author of We Are the Roots, The Organizational Culture of a Home Care Cooperative, published in 2002, the co-editor of Caribbean Connections, Dominican Republic, published by Teaching for Change in 2006, and the author of a variety of other chapters and articles on Latino migration and immigration. Since 1986, Ruth has worked on a variety of public history projects, including oral history, exhibits, curriculum materials, and video documentaries. Welcome, Ruth. Next, we have Esperanza Sanchez. She is the associate curator at LA Plaza de Cultura y Artes, she holds a Master of Arts in History and a Bachelor of Arts in History with an emphasis on U.S., European, and Latin American foreign relations and a minor in sociology, both from California State University, Northridge. She previously held positions at the Autry Museum of the American West, the Museum of Latin American Art, and California State University, Northridge. She has co-curated Linda Vallejo, Brown Belongings, Ya Basta, the East LA Walkouts and the Power of Protest, and Artists Assemble, Empowerment and Inspiration in Contemporary Comics. She is working on a new upcoming exhibition, Patriotism in Conflict, Fighting for Country and Comunidad. Her museum work has received mention in the LA Times, KCET Artbound, KPPC, Huffington Post, and many others. Welcome, Esperanza. We also very much hope that we will be joined tonight by Representative Hilda E. Santiago, excuse me, yes, Hilda E. Santiago. Um, she's having technological difficulties, but we do very much hope that she'll join us. 
Uh, Representative Santiago was elected to serve Meriden's 84th Assembly District in 2012. She was appointed Assistant Deputy Speaker pro tempore, the first female and Latina to be named to this high ranking leadership position in the House. She also serves in the legislature's finance, revenue and bonding, government administration and elections, and human services committees. Born in Naranjito, Puerto Rico, and raised in New York City, Hilda's family moved to Meriden, Connecticut during her senior year in high school. She obtained a Bachelor of Science in Secondary Education from Southern Connecticut State University, majoring in History and Latin American Studies. Hilda was appointed to serve on the Meriden City Council in 1996 and later became the first Puerto Rican female to win an open seat in Meriden City Council in 2005. She has been a strong advocate of civil and human rights, as well as an avid supporter of Latino equality throughout her career. Welcome, Representative Santiago. This evening, we'll start with a presentation by Ruth Glasser. Ruth? Great, thank you very much. I wonder if it's possible now to get the screens up, the, uh, the slides up on the screen. Um, I'd like to, um, I actually, I don't see it. I'm wondering where the, um, where my slides are. Um, okay, um, I don't see the slides, but I will keep going with the presentation. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about stereotypes about Latino women. Um, and to, to note that spitfire, bombshell, and other such words have been the mainstream stereotypes for Latinos in the movies since the early years of the 20th century and beyond and have continued in movies and TV shows. And um, Latinos have often had things, um, adjectives like hot and spicy, unreflectingly appended to their descriptions. Uh, Latinas have been portrayed very often in the media as over-sexualized, promiscuous, prone to early and frequent pregnancy, highly emotional, violent, vindictive, voluptuous, obsessed with makeup and tight-fitting clothes. In turn, they have been cast in roles that perpetuate those stereotypes and others. Apparently, by the way, one of the reasons that Rita Moreno did not have a robust film career is that after West Side Story, for which she won a Best Supporting Actor, Actress Oscar, is that she kept getting offers for roles to play Latina gang members. Another major stereotype is that of the humble domestic. The late actor Lupe Ontiveros, most famous for playing Selena's fan club president and her murderer in the movie Selena, um, in which Selena was played by Jennifer Lopez, of course, and the mother in Real Women Have Curves, estimated at one point that she had played a maid some 150 times on screen and in the theater. And what she says about that is, she says, I got chicken manure and I made chicken salad out of it. I, made the, I, I did a great job and I tried to humanize the maids that I portrayed. Um, in more recent years, Latinas have been getting more roles in American TVs and movies and sometimes more nuanced ones, but they're still woefully underrepresented and likely to be typecast. And one of the things that I wanted to say about this is that I think that these stereotypes are pernicious both for outsiders and for insiders. They reinforce the othering of Latinas as exotic and um, exaggerated. And they also provide very pernicious role models for young Latinas who are looking for role models to which they can aspire. And so, for example, the stereotype of promiscuity, the idea of Latinas as being somehow sexually hot and available and prone to early pregnancy has been something that has worked against young Latinas. For example, I've heard numerous and countless stories of young Latinas who are caring for younger siblings and who have been asked by outsiders if these are their children. Um, another thing is that um, I wonder sometimes if these obsessions with sexuality and appearance are some of the reasons that some of the students that I've worked with at UConn who've gone on to professional careers have been steered by guidance counselors and teachers into careers in beauty, in cosmetology. So for example, I have a student who's one of my first students, Delma Liz Medina, 
who was told to go to beauty school. Now, then Maliz has her master's in social work and is a school social worker. And she's just one of numerous stories of this type. But what I wanna do is just very, very briefly get beyond the stereotypes and also get beyond valorizing just the famous people and talk about the, the less famous people, the non-famous people. Um, I think it's really important to note that Latinas have often done really important work behind the scenes to migrate, to cope with being left behind in their home country or territory when men migrate, to raise families and build community in, in places like Connecticut. And so I want to just mention a couple of non-famous women from Waterbury who really helped to build the Latino community here. Um, so the first woman I want to mention is Genoveva Rodriguez. Genoveva, Doña Genoveva, was a woman who came to, shortly after World War II, she came with her husband Tomas to Waterbury, and she bore and raised 12 children. And while she did that, she was actually doing a lot of work on social justice issues. One of the things that she did was she went out to the migrant worker camps to the agricultural places where Puerto Ricans were working, picking tobacco and fruit and vegetables. And she helped the migrant workers. And in fact, was one of the people who really instigated the organization of those migrant workers into unions. She helped to establish the first Hispanic Catholic church in Waterbury and to provide social services in an era when social services were still not available in, in a really major form. So I wanted to mention that. And there's a lot more to be said about women like Doña Genoveva. The last thing I want to mention is the heroic work of Dominican women. Um, one Dominican woman that I want to mention is Felicia Diaz, who um, came to Waterbury as a single parent, raised several children, and was a pionera, a pioneer in many, many ways. Um, one of the ways that she is a, a pionera that I think I really want to mention here, although there are many others, is the fact that she is one of the founding members of the local Hispanic Child Care Providers Association, which in the 90s, when the Clinton administration was going, was ending welfare as we know it, um, provided child care for women who were then able to go to work and get culturally appropriate child care lessons in Spanish, talk in Spanish, and culturally appropriate activities. So I just wanted to start with that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth. Esperanza? Hi, thank you. So thank you, Ruth, and thank you, Ariel, and everyone else is joining. Good evening. Um, so just to touch on the same um, points that uh, Ruth was also talking about, I also feel that not only is it movies and television that are perpetuating the stereotypes about Latinas, but also even music industry as well. So we've seen the range uh, from pop all the way down to reggaeton, where you have beautiful women. Uh, for example, when I was a child in the 90s, I the only women that I saw out there were Gloria Stefan uh, and Jennifer Lopez, right? And that's just in the US, while for Latin America, I got to see a whole range of different artists coming about. And you have uh, Shakira, who um, had her her Spanish speaking music and looked very different for what she looks like to now when she started coming in in the early 2000s. And then you compare her to Thalia and Paulina Rubio and um, Laura uh, Pautuzzini and, and many more uh, people that are coming out there. And it's always the same kind of story of like, you have to have that sex appeal, you have to look very sexy and, and sensual and, and have this incredible voice and dance really well. And, and when you see those type of people, you start to internalize it a little bit and you start to think, is that how am I supposed, is this is how, is this how I'm supposed to look? And of course, with the magazines, you start to see what um, even Latina magazines, sometimes when I was looking at it, I would look at it and go, oh, these are all light skin, almost blonde women. And sometimes I would question and ask, why is it that we don't have darker skinned women on these covers? Um, however, I do see that there is a progression and it's changed a little bit more. And I feel like even having some of these women in the forefront too, they're able to bring up certain issues that are going on within the community or that affect their homelands or, or countries where their family originated. 
So there's always a discussion about it. But I also have seen a progression even in pop music and even in, for example, reggaeton or even trap music um, and hip hop and R&B. Um, one thing that I noticed a lot in the 90s is you had one identity. There was never this discussion about um, multiculturalism or being of mixed ancestry. And that's something that I started to notice now in the 2000s. And I think reality TV shows started to play that as well. So we have, for example, Cardi B, who is an Afro-Latina. Uh, she is in the rap uh, industry and music, but when you think of her, you kind of start to wonder like, oh, would she have been as popular as she is now? 10, 20 years ago, or would she have just been classified as um, as a Black woman, or would she be considered an Afro-Latina as well? So even her introduction there through love and hip-hop was able to bring in other artists as well who have a mixed ancestry. Um, and the same thing with reggaeton. In the 2000s, um, we also have a lot of males there. It's very male dominated, every industry, of course, as we know, and I think now it's progressed and we're able to bring in more women's voices. But even then, the only artist that I remember seeing there was Ivy Queen. And even then, her voice was limited in comparison to all the men who use women as an objectifier. And of course, there were always Latina women um, who were always sound effects or dancers in the music videos, but they weren't really part of the conversation or even part of the music industry. While now in the last couple of 10 years, I want to say like Becky G and um, Natasha, uh, excuse me, not the Natasha and, and many more other artists that are coming into reggaeton are able to utilize their identity and their complex personalities and really emerge and say, yes, I can be a beautiful, sexy woman, but there's also more to me. Um, and they're able to kind of embrace their personalities and um, perspective and their sexuality without being deemed as only the sexy Latina woman, because they're also producing their own music, they're creating the music videos and writing their music. And so it's more broader. So I think that's another great way of how it's been expanded. However, there is so much more that needs to be represented. And I think more voices needs to come out and more marginalized voices that we're not used to seeing when we think of what is a Latina. If you were to Google right now online, you see very light skinned people. You do not see any mixed ancestry or religion or different cultures. So I hope that that ex continues to expand down the road. Um, the second point too, I think when it comes to Latinas, we sometimes forget about the contributions that people do bring to the community, especially when there are a lot of migrants, uh, especially migrant workers that are coming in. For example, I live in Los Angeles. And so I live in a very large city and it's uh, a very populous and we have many diverse cultures and religion and it's always great. However, when it came down to COVID-19, because we're such a populous city, we also had issues with COVID-19 and where people were exposed to the virus because a lot of them were very, uh, were important essential workers, whether they worked in the medical field or in emergency services or even in law enforcement. You also had people who worked in agriculture and food industry, uh, maintenance and janitorial jobs. And it was just a constant range. And on top of it, living in a city, it's already expensive enough to live here without being able to afford housing. So it means that a lot of people are living within close quarters. So if people are exposed to the virus because of their work, they're bringing in home, which is potentially exposing other people. And of course that did hit Los Angeles very hard and it hit the Latino and Latina community very, very hard as well. Um, so that's something that I will talk about <laughs> later in detail, but luckily people have been working together to try to help others and provide them with access to Medicare, access to benefits and, and protective gear and other ways to improve to reduce COVID-19. And I guess the last uh, point that I have is also mentioning that um, it's very important to also talk about the stories of women and how they contributed to um, not only the nation, but also within the community here in Los Angeles. And I think it's a little different, but um, just because we have more people here, but I'm excited to talk about that in more detail. So thank you. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, to our audience, just an update that we're still waiting on Representative Santiago, who's having terrible technological difficulties. So we're gonna keep the conversation going. And if she is able to join us, we'll, we'll cut away to her, her five minutes uh, and get her right into the conversation. 
So I'm so fascinated to hear both of you talk about representation and uh, and the problems of Latina representation over many years. Um, I study Latin American history, and one of the things that we talk about is the representation of Latin America itself as a sexualized woman, uh, the, the whole region. <laughs> um, and, and I think that that has, that has played um, a similar type of, of of role around ideas of availability and promiscuity and so forth. Um, one of the questions that we had formulated beforehand that I think really um, ties both of your talks together really nicely is about precisely about representation, specifically in museums and art galleries. And I know um, Esperanza, you work in museums uh, and Ruth, you've done exhibitions and you worked with museums. Um, what do you think about the role of museums and art galleries in changing these stereotypes, doing away with the stereotypes and, um, and creating better, more nuanced and whole representation of the, the great diversity of Latin American women in, in, in the United States. Okay, I'll go first, thank you. Um, no, that's a great question. Thank you, Ariel, for asking that. Um, it's true, it is very important that we have more representations of Latinos and Latinas. Um, one of the ways, for example, that I, I work at the Lee Plaza Cultura Artes, and so our focus is on Mexican, Mexican Americans, and Latinos in Los Angeles and Southern California. And so we barely are going to hit our 10 year mark in April. And so we're the only museum that is focusing on uh, Latinx communities. And so we're very fortunate that we have access to the community. We have access to the resources of the different universities and archives that are here. So we're able to pull those stories, but also because we're working with the community, we're able to engage them and bring in some of the objects that we need because a lot of institutions are not collecting them. And for example, as La Plaza, we don't have a collective uh, at the moment where we're actively collecting these things. However, we do understand that our mission is very important, but it's also an understanding that because no one is telling our stories, we have to tell the stories ourselves. Um, and another great thing about it, because I, as a historian, I'm able to look at the perspective of what's going on in Los Angeles and in the country, but then I'm also constantly thinking about what about women? You know, we understand that a lot of women are involved in activism, community organizing, making sure that everyone is getting their education and, and making sure that there's job security in the homes. However, their stories are never really recorded unless you have a historian out there or you have someone who is doing a journalist piece in order to kind of introduce that idea. And so this is what we do at the museum is we try to narrow in and focus on those stories because we also are aware that other museums outside of ourselves are not really focusing on those stories because their missions are very different from ours. And so I feel that art galleries also can take this opportunity instead of just saying, okay, we're going to do Latinos um, and we're just going to use one or two or one or two African-Americans or one or two Asian. I think they need to look at what Los Angeles really represents and really do pull in women and not just the women that are predominant and have been exhibited in many museums, but also people who are emerging, who are photographers, who are artists um, to share that story. So I hope that that's a way that they can do that. And I know small private little galleries have done that, like the Charles James Gallery. Um, I would recommend that if you wanna look into some of those of how they also introduce emerging Latinas as well, not just uh, Latino men or just men uh, within the community. Okay, um, I, I think Esperanza has really said quite a bit and I don't have that much to add to this, but I do wanna say that, yes, I think that it's really important that we represent people who are not necessarily famous and who do kind of behind the scenes work in their communities. And museums are certainly one way to do it. Another way to do it that I think is extremely important is through curriculum materials. A lot of times curricula for um, pre-collegiate uh, students tends to focus on this kind of what we would call the heroes and holidays approach, where we learn about famous people and we learn about cultural celebrations, but we don't learn about people going around in everyday life, making conditions better for people in the community. 
That's such an excellent point, uh, Ruth. And thank you also to es Esperanza for your comments. Um, it's great to think about museums and art gallery spaces. And thank you for the specific recommendation of a gallery that's doing uh, that, that work to raise up uh, emerging Latina artists. I think that's so important. Um, Ruth, your, your final comments led me right into my next question. Thank you. Um, here in Connecticut, there has recently been an effort to prepare uh, teachers to teach Latino and Puerto Rican studies in schools, um, in addition to African American and Black studies. And it's interesting that a lot of educators seem to have um, expressed to the folks that are organizing this effort that they have some idea of how to do African American uh, studies. They, they have some sense of what that looks like, but there seems to be much less community knowledge about how to do Latino and Puerto Rican studies. And so I wonder uh, what your curricular uh, recommendations are uh, for anybody out there watching this who is a teacher who's preparing to teach these these new um, studies in their in their classrooms or who uh, maybe we have some school administrators here or some education folks on the state level what would you say to them as experts in this field about uh, Latino and Puerto Rican studies in general and then specifically how do we teach about Latina history Okay. Well, I'll try to tackle a little of this. I have not had access, direct access to the Latino studies curriculum that's part of this new effort. But my understanding is that it's, it's, it's fairly problematic at this stage. And one of the problems that I think it represents is the fact that it focuses almost entirely on the Puerto Rican experience. And while Puerto Ricans are still the majority population here in Connecticut among Latinos, they are increasingly diversifying so that we have a, a very substantial population, a growing population of Mexicans, of Central Americans from specific countries, of people from um, South America, particularly from Peru and Colombia and Ecuador. And those stories are not necessarily being represented. Um, I also, from my understanding, the process of developing the curriculum has gotten somewhat politicized and hasn't necessarily relied on a combination of community members and historical experts to put it together. So I guess my recommendation would be to depoliticize the process, to make sure that all Latino groups are represented, to privilege the experience of women, and to show the ways in which the experience of women is often very different from the experience of men, both in the migration and in the settlement, and to make sure that the curriculum reflects all those different kinds of experiences. Esperanza, uh, can you give us a sense of any kind of efforts of this type that are going on in Southern California? Are you aware of uh, the way that Latino uh, studies may be taught in the schools there? Sure. No, thank you for introducing that idea. Um, it's a little different here in Los Angeles and where we do have a curriculum and there are um, ways that uh, teachers are including Latina and Latino history. Um, in the very beginning, there was some struggles about how to add it into the curriculum. Um, and so you have a lot of teachers and a lot of people uh, in the Board of Supervisors and, and many teachers, uh, advocacy groups also advocating for not just Latino, but also African American and Asian studies. And it's something that we've been grappling for years because one of the main problems that we've had since the 60s is that you had a lot of Mexican, Mexican Americans, but also Central Americans who were involved in walkouts. And the main problem was that there wasn't enough bilingual education. There wasn't any connection to their family's histories or, or native um, or excuse me, a native um, perspective and, and, and things of that sort. But something that they've been doing here is really advocating for teachers to really look into the history and work with their students in order to make them understand not only history of, of, of the United States, but also of Los Angeles and what it represented going as back from 1781 um, when the, the Spanish, you know, came into the, the Los Angeles area, but you had people who were mixed ancestry. They weren't fully European. Um, and so they're, they're grappling with that because there was a lot of whitewash history that was going on as well. Um, but it's something that's constantly moving back and forth. And I know that there's been divisions and, and struggles within the student union, excuse me, the teacher 
teacher unions and also the curriculum that's being developed by LUSD. But it's an ongoing conversation back and forth. I do know with the university and college levels, uh, there was an issue where they were trying to eliminate ethnic studies from being a requirement uh, for all students to take uh, during the general studies. And luckily that got pushed back because it is important to understand what people have dealt with and why it's necessary for them to understand the perspective from Latinos, um, from Asian Americans or, or African Americans. Um, and this was during the Trump era too. So it kind of um, put a lot of people into perspective of why it's necessary to have these conversation and even why it's more prominent now, especially as we are trying to heal our country and, and move forward and, and understand one another. So um, it's an ongoing battle here. That's what I could just say. Thank I'd you. actually like to add something to that, if I may. Um, I think that in places like Los Angeles, maybe less so in, in places like Waterbury, but certainly in places like Los Angeles, I think one of the dangers is the erasure of the physical history. I mean, thinking about the story of Chavez Ravine and how it was destroyed and the community was scattered and the effects of urban renewal and the effects of the building of highways and more recently gentrification on a lot of traditionally Latino communities in places like LA, New York City, Chicago, et cetera. I think the physical spaces get destroyed and then there's no evidence that they've ever existed. So it's really incumbent upon us as historians to document that and to create heritage trails as some of my colleagues like Ann Gebeline have done here in um, Connecticut so that people know that even if things don't still exist, they used to exist. And I think that's also important from the point of view of policy and the, the general public's perspective, because a lot of times people tend to pillory members of the Latino community for not being successful entrepreneurs or uh, residents of neighborhoods or creative um, agents. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of times their efforts have been destroyed, they've been erased, and so there's no trace of them. And we have to restore those traces. We have to we have to reconstruct that history and make it known. That's an excellent point. Um, thanks, thanks to both of you for those those important um, comments and and perspectives. Um, you've talked both um, to some extent already about struggle. Um, and and the strength of Latinas in dealing with some of the struggles that they face. Um, and Esperanza, you talked about how um, COVID uh, has been a particular struggle. Um, I'm I, I'm wondering about visibility. Um, and we you know we sort of started the the whole talk on this issue of. Uh, the wrong kind of visibility, right? A, a, a distorted, uh, stereotyped kind of visibility that was being foisted upon Latinas. Um, let's talk about the visibility or invisibility of Latinas' strength and their struggles. Um, some people think that once uh, a Latina arrives here in the United States that they've reached a great goal and everything's hunky-dory, right? Everything's fine. Um, but indeed, there is a great deal of struggle here within the United States. The migration is not necessarily the, the be-all and end-all, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit about, about struggle and strength uh, in, in, any, in any context that you care to comment. Okay. Okay. I'll go first. Sorry, Ruth. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ariel, for asking that question. Yes, it's a it's a good question that you're asking because I think um, it's not just the the media, but I think also people tend to forget that people do come here because they are trying to get a better opportunity. They're coming here to remove themselves because they're. Uh, dictator government sometimes or oppressive regimes are involved, but also on top of it too, I think women who are migrating to the U.S., especially Latino women, are trying to move away from oppression and, and making sure that they are providing for their family sometimes at home. Um, and one of the things too is that you do have a lot of invisibility and um, what happens with a lot of these women is yes they do reach here but at the same time there's also fear they are dealing with harassment whether it's sexually or physically um they are put in a situation where they're not able to make complaints or if they do they feel that they're going to be deported or they're going their job is going to be taken away or they're going to be put in a situation where they can't depend on anyone not even on themselves and so 
a lot of the things too that we forget, and especially we got to see it here in Los Angeles, is that a lot of these women that are migrating from Latin America, these Latino women are our essential workers. So they're the ones that are working in the medical field. They're the ones who are the school teachers. They're also the ones that are working and cleaning our offices, the janitorial, the maintenance, but also our grocery stores as well. And on top of it, they also have their families and their kids. And so you see the discrepancy of all the work that needs to get done for themselves and for their families. And then on top of it, they also have children that they have to take care of. And so here in Los Angeles, we haven't been able to open up our schools. And a lot of these moms have to also concentrate on making sure that their kids are going through school. And on top of it, if they don't have the education background, how do they deal with the technology of helping their child understand math or English or or science or history, and then on top of it, add technology. And so I think that's one of the main problems that's going on. On top of it, too, you also have women who are dealing with PTSD because of the issues that they're dealing with from their home countries, or even when they migrated. You have a lot of them who have been sexually assaulted or abused in the process, or they're coming with someone, and, and, and at that time, that individual, their partners also abusing them as well. So they don't feel like they have an outlet or if they do, then they lose someone that can be providing to their home and income um, and taking care of their kids as well. So that's one of the struggles that I have seen here in the country. And I think here in Los Angeles, it, the, a lot of the officials have tried to establish policies um, or, or preventative things uh, to to allow women to come and actually express and, and ask for sometimes even if they need food stamps or if they need assistance for something. And I think it's always a, a combination of do you trust or do you not trust? And I think this is where some of the organizations in Los Angeles have been able to help uh, Latino women in order to gain more access um, to help them regardless of their legal status. So. So. I, I think Esperanza has really put it very well. And um, I just want to, I guess, say a couple of things. Um, one, that the Latinas that I have interviewed um, here in the uh, Connecticut area, a lot of them are working full-time jobs and also doing jobs on the side. And so this is, I'm not even talking about the COVID era, but pre-COVID. Um, a lot of times they're participating in an informal economy where they're cutting hair and they're baking cakes and they're cleaning houses. And they're also, in addition to that, providing temporary shelter for newcomers, family members and friends from their home countries and their hometowns. So they do a lot of kin work in addition to the other work that they're doing. Um, but the other thing I do want to say on a more positive note is that there are times when I think that Latina experiences in immigration or migration are actually liberating um, as compared to the male experience. Um, you know, I think, for example, of some of the studies that have been done on Dominican women and the Dominican women that I've spoken to who have said that when they've come here, they've been able to play a much more active role within the household if they're in a married couple or in some sort of a couple arrangement, and that they are then able to make many more of the financial decisions and the family decisions than they were able to back home. And of course, sometimes that is very dismaying to the men in the relationship because those kind of what Peggy Levitt would call social remittances go back home and women back in the Dominican Republic or in other home countries start to say, hey, wait a minute, we're going to share the housework from now on because I have a voice too. So I think that there is sometimes an empowering aspect to the immigration or the migration for Latinos as well. That's an excellent point. Thank you both. Um, the next question plays uh, on this, this same theme, and that is about um, specifically Latina leadership. Um, so I appreciate uh, Ruth reminding us that we need to not take a, a great woman uh, view of history and only look at famous people. Of course, we want to recognize the representation of uh, famous Latinas. Um, so I'm going to open up the question and say, let's talk about Latina leadership either by famous people or by people that we haven't heard of, maybe, who are leading in a different sort of way than through celebrity. 
Well, I can go first. Um, no, that's a great question. I think we do sometimes forget and we do focus on the civil rights leaders or, or famous people who have foundations. And that's something that um, has been great. And I think here in Los Angeles, it's important because it took so long for those people to get recognition sometimes. And they continue to still do the work and inspire younger the next uh, generations to continue moving forward. But I do agree with you. Sometimes we forget about the people who did all the work. And one of them that I can think of is like Alicia Escalante, who in the 1960s, um, early on, uh, you know, she was looking at all of the low income that was going on in East Los Angeles, the lack of education, the lack of resources. And she ended up creating um, a, a welfare organization in order to provide women with more resources and ways for kids to also get their education. And on top of it, what I really like about it is that her own children ended up creating the Brown Berets, um, which at, in the very beginning, they were focusing on other aspects. But what they were focusing on is education and providing just uh, uh, justice for the community as well, because there was issues with the police and, and with the sheriff's department and also making sure that people were registering to vote. So all of these things, and then on top of it, Vietnam. And so I, I do like her story because this is an organization that continues to this day and it does provide continuing resources for people. But I do like that because of these leadership that was going on in Los Angeles, there was also opportunities to create more uh, nonprofits and more resources for people within Los Angeles. Uh, we have Churla who focuses on immigration rights. We have Ola, which is providing youth um, that is in Latin the next communities, the opportunity to be involved in athletics and after school programs and the arts. And, and there's many more. So I, I think that's always the nice part about it is that we can talk about the people within the community. And it's always nice to see how these Latino women are the ones that are at the forefront. And a lot of the times they've done a lot of the what was considered the domestic or uh, secretarial work. But now they were able to establish these organizations or nonprofits, which is also very important because they were able to mobilize people. So um, one of the persons that I can think of is like Dolores Huerta, who not only focused, she was a teacher too, by the way. Uh, she started off as a teacher, then started mobilizing and working with community service organization in order to uh, help farm workers. But then in the end run, what ended up happening is by working with the community service organization, she was able to establish grassroots organizations and mobilization, which helped to register people to vote. So I think that's always important. I think those small contributions of both Latinas and Latinos help create a larger network to get more people involved. So I hope that it continues to happen because as we've seen, as with our election, it, it helped to change, um, hopefully for a better uh, opportunity for all of us, but it just kind of mobilized people. So I hope that that continues to, to happen, especially with Latinas being at the forefront. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, the, I mentioned a couple of women earlier as kind of representatives of one being a Puerto Rican, an early Puerto Rican leader, and the other being a, a later Dominican leader who is still in the community. Um, so the first woman I mentioned, Genoveva Rodriguez, who is from Hayuya, Puerto Rico, um, was she really worked through the Catholic Church and beyond to establish, to help establish some of the first social service organizations that catered to Latinos in the city of Waterbury. So in a sense, she was she was the forerunner who um, helped to establish some of the organizations that still exist today in the community, such as the uh, Spanish Action Council, which got folded into a, a larger organization called the Hispanic Coalition, which still exists in Waterbury. And then uh, people like Felicia Diaz and other Dominican women, as I mentioned, Felicia with a group of other Latinas formed a Hispanic Daycare Providers Association that provided, as I said, culturally appropriate daycare for women who were transitioning from welfare to work back in the 1990s, and it's still running strong and it's still training people. And other women in the community have been very instrumental both in local politics and in international politics. Um, Dominicans can have um, dual citizenship and if they were born in the Dominican Republic and have the proper credentials, they can vote in the Dominican Republic. And so women in places like here in Waterbury have been very instrumental in organizing voters and getting them to polling places to vote for the president of the Dominican Republic, as well as organizing on a local level to make sure that Dominicans have a voice and more power here. 
And in the cultural realm, Dominicans and other members of other more recently arrived groups have helped to um, diversify the Latino church. So, um, you know, just to give a little bit of perspective on this, in the early days, in the um, 1950s, for example, a lot of times um, Latinos could not find places to worship. And I'm speaking specifically here about Catholics. Obviously, there are Latinos who are not Catholics, but they were often uh, basically um, forced to worship in church basements at different times from the regular parishioners, and they fought for the right to worship in the regular sanctuary. And with the arrival of some of the new groups, what they've done, and it's particularly in the labor of women, has been to diversify the celebrations and the events and the activities and the services to the community um, beyond the Puerto Rican model and going into a sort of multi-ethnic and more diversified model. That's so interesting, Ruth. I know here in the New Haven area that the Catholic Church is struggling to keep churches open and Catholic schools open, and it would seem that they would welcome everyone. I guess that, you know, you're talking about older history, but um, it's striking to, to feel that tension there, that now they're, you know, in many cases struggling to, to have enough parishioners to keep a church open. Um, I wanted to think about the, the last few questions that we've had about, about struggle and strength, about um, leadership, and move into a question about policy. Um, what legislation would each of you like to see, either at, at your city level, your state level, or nationally, um, to, to help Latino women? And of course, that's, a, that's an enormous and very diverse category. But if, if you had to think about, um, let's say you were a politician and you want the Latina vote, uh, what kind of policies or legislation would you propose uh, that you think would, would help at least some uh, groups of Latinas? Sure. Thank you for that question, Ariel. That's a wonderful question. Um, and it kind of ties in to, um, I, I work with Puro Political Party, which is um, a small little like uh, Latinx <laughs> grassroots. And we've done this now for two years. Um, and we were very active in the campaigns for Biden and Harris and a couple of swing states um, and, and also even for the Georgia campaigns. And one of the things that we had talked about how if we had this political power and we were, you know, the president or we were, you know, in our, our state, um, whether we were representatives or, or senators, we were thinking about it's very important to have a national voting rights bill. And so, of course, that's at the moment what's going on. So I hope that continues and and we're able to establish that because restricting votes is definitely going to affect more people of color and especially Latinas. Uh, so that's the first one. I think that's very important because having access to vote is very important because that's the way you have your voice. Um, the other sources that I think for legislation within the state and within the cities um, here in Los Angeles, I think having more funds being allocated for education and for community services and mental health is very important. Um, I've seen it here in Los Angeles. It's, it is necessary. And I think we've had discussions about the funds and how they're being distributed to the county, whether it's education or or the jail system or, or policing or even um, community activism. And it's spread out through different places. But I think after Black Lives Matter, uh, the protests that happened over the summer, there was a lot of discussion about where we allocate those funds. And I think it's very important to focus on education, mental health, and, and other resources that will really help the community in order for them to gain more access. Because without that, I think it will restrict certain people from moving forward and having more access or more opportunities. Um, so that's, I think those are the first three things that I would focus on if I, if I was in the political power uh, situation. Yeah, I absolutely, of course, agree with everything that Esperanza has said. Um, you know, we have our own struggles here over the whole issue of voting access, and, and there are bills being proposed in the legislature now that are being struggled over, over the question of absentee voting after COVID. And of course, I really think that voter accessibility is very important. Um, I, in terms of education, I think that one of the problems that we have here in Connecticut, um, and I'm sure that's true in LA, is the whole question of the differential between per capita spending per student in 
urban areas and in suburban areas. And so if I could wave a magic wand and have the power, I would really like to set policy that would put all the money from property taxes in the state into a big pot, swirl it around and have the same amount of spending per capita per student in every school district so that we don't have these differential outcomes for people who come from the inner city and uh, people who come from the wealthier suburbs. So that would be something else. Another thing, of course, is the whole question of the DACA immigrants. Um, you know, I'd like to see legislation that would um, make that would create a path to amnesty and legalization for these immigrants and to make their lives easier and to give them more access to financial aid for education and uh, more pathways to careers. And in general, of course, um, you know, the whole issue of income inequality, I would like to see more career paths in general for um, Latinas among other populations. Um, one of the problems that we have here in the city is that there really isn't enough support for ethnic entrepreneurialism by people of color. And there are many obstacles um, that are in the way of people uh, founding their own businesses. And so it's to me really tragic that in a place like Waterbury, where we have so much ethnic diversity um, and among Latinos, we have a, a huge amount of diversity that it's so difficult for people to get business licenses, to get affordable rents and to get other services that they need, such as business loans for uh, startup businesses that would make the city a much more culturally vibrant place. Yes, 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 and yes. <laughs> I agree with both of you. Um, great, great points. Excellent policy proposals. Um, we are going to turn now to uh, one of the subjects that we started with. I know Esperanza um, mentioned uh, thinking about um, Latina children, young young women. She mentioned her own uh, childhood in the 90s and, and thinking about the way in which everything we've uh, talked about impacts Latina children. Um, so I wonder, the question is, how can we encourage young Latina girls to take on leadership roles in their communities and get involved in positive change? So leadership, activism, um, entrepreneurialism, maybe we could add into the mix. How, how should we be supporting uh, the Latina girls in our schools and communities? Exactly. Well, thank you, Ariel. That's a great question. Um, well, it kind of ties into what I've been doing um, just because when my parents migrated here, um, they migrated here in the 70s and 80s with my grandparents. And so I didn't have a lot of role models, but I did have them as role models of hardworking and making sure to get an education. And I think this is where my teachers were also very important that they were able to demonstrate that there was more that I could reach out for. And I am very grateful to them. And especially because they were of mixed ancestry, but I also had a lot of Latinas in my life who were introducing me to diff different things and different scopes and even museums, um, which is something that I never even thought about. So I think first, most important is mentorship. It's something that I would advocate. Um, it's something that I've done with other institutions and also with other nonprofits. It's introducing people into the aspect that you could be involved in the arts and also even in education, because sometimes I think what happens is we kind of um, don't have a lot of role models because of television or movies or even within our own families. And um, sometimes you get restricted to, you gotta be a lawyer or you gotta be a teacher or you gotta be a doctor. It's very basic. And I think there's so many opportunities for people. And, and even as Ruth mentioned, the opportunities to create your own business. And so I hope that there is more opportunities and one of the ways is to do mentorship, but I think also community service. I think the opportunity as a professional to go in and talk to them, whether it's a career fair, if you're just donating your time, it's a nice way to introduce yourself. But also I think for young Latinas, since they're already doing this in high school, it's a great way to swag them away from not just focusing on the church, but also within their own community. So either working in nonprofits or, or cleaning up certain areas or getting to know their neighborhoods, one way to do it. And I think the other way, too, is to introduce civic education of how it is very important in order to be politically involved, but also community involved to understand the resources that are being allocated to your community and how else that you can advocate, introduce more legislation 
or work within the community in order to bring more resources in. So I think that's another way to do that. Um, and in many ways, I think it's also fostering the youth is is, is opening opportunities, whether it's internships or even part-time positions um, or working with them if they're interns, that's another way too of giving them class credit so that way they can be introduced to a new sector of what Latinas have accessibility to if they decide to go into academia or museums or art or, or even education. Education. So I think those are the a couple of ones. I'm sure Ruth has a couple more. Well, I think you've covered a lot of ground there, Esperanza. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess I would add to that, that for example, here, I don't know how it is in Los Angeles, but we definitely have a dearth of Latino educators and guidance counselors. And I think that's a real problem in terms of mentorship and role models and expectations um, for young Latinas. I think also that we need uh, more robust after school programs um, because a lot of times I think that especially teenagers are considered to be problematic populations and we, we see more programs that are aimed at just sort of keeping them out of trouble and assuming that they're troublemakers. And as you said, I think we need more mentoring, we need more training programs, we need more civic involvement. And I think we also need more culturally reinforcing programs. I think a lot of Latinas grow up um, not speaking Spanish, not knowing much about their cultural traditions and being shamed for it. And um, I've seen that a lot with my students that, you know, there's this almost concept of authenticity that you have to be able to dance, that you have to be able to speak Spanish, that you have to be able to do certain things in order to truly be a member of the culture. And while I don't think people should be shamed for it, I think they should also be given opportunities to engage with that culture if they want to. Those are excellent points. Thank you so much. Um, so. Uh, Mariana has indicated that we're going to just go for one more question because we, we did start a little bit late. So I'm going to actually uh, end with this is, this is sort of a non sequitur, um, but I'm going to end with, with uh, a one, one line question. Who is your Latina heroine and why? Excellent question, Ariel. I'm going to say, I already mentioned her already, Dolores Huerta, and it's mostly because I'm inspired by her activism and also because of her community organizing. But also on top of it, I've worked with her multiple times at La Plaza, and I have to say she is an incredible woman. And it didn't matter that I was just a curatorial assistant. She was very kind to me. And the fact that even to this day, she's still very active and working with the community and willing to meet new people and work with them is it's a it's a good note for me. So I would say Dolores Huerta. I'm not actually sure that I can answer that question because I just worked with so many really interesting and, and um, admirable women. So I'm, I'm not sure that I could say that there's one person that would be my specific Latina hero. Um, so I think I'm gonna actually pass on that question. I think it's fine, Ruth, to, to think about the collectivity of all the amazing women that you've worked with and just think about it in a, in a communal sense, the communal heroine uh, of, of, your, um, uh, of your experience. Uh, I think that's just fine. I don't think you're passing on the question. I just think you're reinterpreting it. Um, and I love that you, you chose Dolores Huerta. Um, I, I actually have uh, daughters, a two-year-old and a, and a seven-year-old, and we have a, a children's book about her. Um, and so we, we are familiar with her in our household, even though we haven't had the pleasure of meeting her. I'm a little bit jealous, I have to say, that you've met her because um, she is she is a, a heroine of mine as well. Um, thank you both so much. I don't know if Mariana is going to jump back in here, but I think we're out of time for the evening. We're so sorry that Representative Santiago was unable to join us. She tried and tried and tried, but her technology failed her. So we're sorry that she didn't get to join the conversation, but it was a robust conversation nonetheless. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, no, thank you both so much. And also, Erica, yeah. thank you so much. Uh, everybody, uh, again, I do apologize that Representative Santiago was not able to join us. She did have some uh, tech issues. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And again, thank you to our speakers. Uh, before we sign off, I would just like to take one second to share with you a couple of upcoming programs that we have here at the Connecticut uh, Old State House. On Wednesday, uh, March the 24th at 6 p.m., we have our next Encounters program, Bushnell Park and the Paradoxes of Urban Renewal. 
Uh, this is done in partnership with the Hartford Public Library, and we'll be focusing on Bushnell Park and uh, its relationship to urban development here in Hartford. On Wednesday, April the 7th, we have our another uh, program that we'll be co-sponsoring with El Instituto, actually, The Undocumented Americans, a conversation with Carla Cornejo Villavicencio. And finally, on Thursday, April 15th, uh, at 7 p.m., we have Witness Stones, a conversation with Dennis Cullington. Uh, Cullington. Um, so yes, uh, you can find a link to all of those events on our Old State House Facebook page, and I hope to see you there as well. Again, thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you so much, Ariel, for moderating, and thank you to El Instituto for co-sponsoring this program. It was amazing. And thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.